Oh, nice. Um, this is my new friend, uh, Carrie Brown, and she's going to get a chance to talk in a minute. Thank you, Carrie, for joining me today. Um, she's going to tell us a bit about herself and her journey through the Master Hand Knitting Program. So let's see who's on here. I see all kinds of people. So fun. I see Missy13208 from New York and Zabo Maria from Denmark. Um, CDR Butler from Virginia, Susan Day from Washington, Elizabeth Nielsen from Sweden, Francoise, hello Francoise, from Lyon, France, Luana Hendricks from Missouri, Jess P. from Billings, Montana, Mary Scott from Southern California. Hi Mary, nice to see you here. Ruth Steubens and Ruth, oh my goodness, so nice to see Ruth from British Columbia. Katharina Creetley from Germany, Trevster, hi Trevster, Trevor from Spain, Nicole Jason from Germany, Hamburg, Germany, Rona Shane from Southern California. Hi, Rona. Charlene Kosmeyer. Hey, Charlene. Nice to see you, too. Anne Tremoliers from France. Hi, Anne. Kay and Tong. Love to see Kay and Elena Lee from Chile, uh, Lutherville, Maryland. Francis Davis from Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Francis. Diana jo Diane Joel from Martinez, California. Uh, so fun to see everybody. Um, Alice, Nicole J. Josen, uh, Janet Hubbard, Margaret from Chile. Hi, Margaret, you made it. Yay! Brenda Can, Karen Tierney, um, Angela Nierscotta, Mary Pfeffer. Hi, Mary, nice to see you. Katharina Creetley, Patricia Durdley, Judith Lausch, Christy, Amy Hazuga from New York City. Scott Brown from Indiana, so K Baker from Sonoma. So nice to see everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, a lot of these people have been working on the Master Hand Knitting Program or are interested in it. And a lot of them have taken my boot camp classes too. And so they're all interested in finessing their knitting. So Carrie, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Tell us a little bit, I'd like to know, how did you get involved in knitting to begin with? What drew you to knitting? Growing up, I did a lot of crocheting and other needlework. My grandmother taught me to crochet when I was five. I also did counter cross stitch and needlepoint up to 72 stitches per inch. I enjoyed doing that all through my teenage years. Then I put it aside for about 30 years and focused on my education and my career. In college, I majored in chemistry and economics, and then I did another four years to get my doctorate of optometry degree, and I was an optometrist for 20 years. Wow. That would keep a person busy. That would keep a person very busy. That was similar to me. I started when I was five, too. We have a lot in common, and I did crocheting first. Are you a continental knitter or a thrower? I'm a thrower. Oh. I started with the crochet, but I do both. When I do the um, fair isle, I really like having the yarn in both hands. Right, I do and too. That, and that, that seems very easy. That may be because of the crochet. It seems balanced. But I think the purl stitches seem to be in better tension when I'm you know, using it in my right hand. Right, so right. So I'm a continental knitter, but I because I learned to crochet first, I just transitioned. I continued holding the yarn in my left hand and I had to teach myself to throw to do stranded knitting holding one yarn in each hand but I still do my pearls with my left hand continental mm -hmm. style so you've been a busy lady so then what drew you what first brought your attention to even anything about the master hand knitting program well it was um with the knitting it came about because we were doing a lot of outdoor activities and we became interested in studying the natural fibers and then I read a couple articles. One was an avid um, skier, and another one was an archeologist that did a lot of hiking. And they both raved about custom hand knit socks made in natural wool, and they preferred them over the store-bought socks for their activities. So that's where I decided I wanted to knit, learn to knit, so I could make those socks for my family. Wow, and how interesting. I bought a full set of Chalgu new knitting needles right off the bat. I had the five inch, the metal tips I prefer, and I still prefer those. And the yard shop, I bought the needles at, we're having a sock contest that ended the next month. So I need goals. I do better with goals. 
So I signed up to give myself a deadline to learn to knit and get at least one pair made. And I taught myself to knit through library books and videos. And my first project was two at a time socks knit toe up because I was intrigued by Judy Becker's magic cast on method. And so a month later when the contest was over, I had three pairs made and I won a set of Addy um, click interchangeable needles in olive wood. That was wow. new that summer. Wow. But then I wanted to learn more about knitting. So I used socks as like a, a big swatch that you could wear, but I used that to test out new techniques I was reading about. I would go to the library and check out stacks and stacks of books at each visit. And I felt like I was back in grad school with the amount of research I was doing, but I wanted to learn more. The more you get into it, you realize there's more techniques to learn. Right. And also enjoyed at that time, I started really enjoying about the history and the evolution of knitting in the different countries. And also some of the traditional knit where I saw or the special yarns that they would have from those countries. And then in addition, when I was reading the library books, even though I was only doing socks, I started reading about sweater construction, just reading about it. And I became interested in the sweaters and I wanted to knit sweaters. My husband questioned if I was ready to jump into that um, because I've only been knitting about six months at the time, but I felt confident I could do it. And I told him that many of the techniques I was learning in sock knitting were the same techniques I would need for the sweaters. Exactly. A sock is like a miniature sweater. It yes. is. It took me a lot of the discipline yes. with that. And then I made um, 12 sweaters in 12 months. My wow. first sweater was a, I've got this sweater. My first sweater was this Fair Isle yoke sweater. Wow. I love, I love the different colors in it. And then my second sweater was a steep cardigan. Um, You're a brave lady. It was fun. Right. And I, I wasn't worried about it because I was so excited about learning the technique. Right. It was this um, stick cardigan, and it was made in the Icelandic, the Plutolopi yarn, which is a, it's a very fragile, thin strand when you're working with it, and it's unspun, but it was, it was fun to work with. Wow. Um, Beautiful work. Sweaters I chose because for the number of techniques that it would teach me, or the yarn it was, if it was a new fiber that I hadn't used before. Right. And a lot of the techniques I was learning with the sweaters were the same essential techniques I found out I was needing to use in the master knitting program. And my last sweater in that group of 12 was um, the last sweater that I made before I jumped into the program. And it was your first eye tag. Knit along. Oh, how cool is that? This was the sweater. Oh, that's beautiful. And you also had mentioned about how important it was. I don't know if you can see, but where you tied the cable into the cup. Yes. So I yes. really liked the, the cable. It was one of the cables that you, you know, suggested, but I right. thought it looks so pretty going into the cup like that. And then it had your, your, your nice pocket. Oh, it's beautiful. And, oh, and it, well, and you also, you taught me about cable flare. You taught me about intarsia. So I learned a lot of wonderful things in doing that project. Yes. And that was where I also learned about the master you were talking about that quite a bit during that knit along uh -huh. and a lot of the names, you know, that I hear on your videos, a lot of those were the same people in that first knit along. So it was neat to recognize the names. Yes. Isn't that cool? Yes. <laughs> I love everybody. It's like we have this worldwide community. It's just amazing. Amazing. So then when did you get like decide you're going to do the master hand knitting program? How did that happen? Well, I did hear about master knitting, of course, from your videos. I heard about it from Ann Bud uh -huh. and so uh, Roxanne Richardson. And but I thought about it for like a, probably over a year before I decided to actually sign up and do it. So I um, signed up. It was um, September the 2nd of um, when was it? 2020. So and then it, it took me about uh, a year and three months. Exactly. So tell us, you know, how did you buckle down? What was your process of buckling down and just diving full body in to um, the program? Well, are you talking about the organization for the binder? And the yeah, program? just like, how did you get yourself set? And what was your process? Like, you know, when I started, I had like, 
I had two TV trays, okay? Mm -hmm. I had one in front of me that had the binder and I, I created a fake binder so I could write in it. It was like my preliminary binder. And then on the other TV tray, I had all my stacks of books. And so when I would do a technique, I would go through every single one of my books, not just three. Mm -hmm. I would go through all of them and I would put a post-it note on the page for that technique. Yes. And then I would review them all. And then I would do my technique and then I would add it to my binder. So okay. that's kind of was my process. Yeah. What did you do? What I would do initially is when I would download the instructions, I got on the computer and I set up my documents. I labeled the documents and I opened the um, folders pretty much the way you put the um, dividers in the binder. So I used those headings. But that gave me a place that I could also make notes or put down the links of the, um, the videos or the references that I thought were the most helpful. And I did, I checked out all these different references and videos and selected the ones I thought were the best ones to use. And let me pause you just for a second and tell people that when you're doing this, you absolutely have to document everything because you'll see a really cool technique. And if you don't write it down, you may not find it again. That is very true. I and so, that too yes. early on. And yes. I thought it was writing down notes, like which one I like the best, but sometimes there'd be some kind of aspect or a statement made and I'd have to watch all of them over again to catch the one that kind of emphasized something that I thought was really good or a good way of relaying the information. Right. So that is, you know, and I would write down why I like that video or why I like that reference, you know, the aspects of it. Um, the other thing is when I was ready to write like the instructions on how to do techniques or to write the pattern, I also did like you, I had all my reference books that were stacked up. I've got a dining room table that has eight chairs. So it's really a big area. But I had lots of different stacks of books. They all have little um, bookmarks in there. And I would just go through and um, did a lot of typing. I did the written work first. So I would, I would do the short written work, like the reviews, um, book reports first. And then I would do the longer reports about like the history or about the fiber reports um, next. And then I'm, during the program, I was also, I've got kids that are in high school and middle school. And so I was away from the house for anywhere from nine to 11 hours, depending on the day. So I would, ahead of time, I would think, okay, what spot am I ready for? And then I would download all the articles that I would want that would pertain, might pertain from the cast on magazine. And I'd also grab any of my reference books, the textbooks, and I would carry them in a crate out to the car. <laughs> and but I had a lot of time. I did all my reading and I read all, I probably did, I, I felt like I did more reading than I needed to, but um, I had plenty of time to do that. And I would read about the history, you know, behind some swatches, even if they were asking about the history, but knowing about the history just made swatch more fun and exciting, you know, during that time. And I couldn't see videos on how to, so I'd have to kind of look ahead, like um, maybe at bedtime, I would stay up and try to watch videos I would think would be helpful. <laughs> a lot of it was reading. And then the other thing I did, I had a composition book. Let me grab my composition book. Um, my middle son is an engineer minded, so he likes the composition books that have graph paper in it. So that's what I used. I filled up this whole composition book for every level. But on the composition book, that's where I could handwrite, you know, any notes when I was away from the house. I would also write out rough drafts, you know, for the technique instructions. I would write the rough draft for pattern writing, and then I could test them out, you know, as I'm knitting. So right, I, right, exactly. Um, Yes. The other thing is the graph paper allowed me to draw out the charted designs or when I'm working on a project, my mind is so focused on different aspects. So if I'm getting ready to do like the shaping of the arm or the neck and where the cable was, I was also writing that out in my composition book and trying to see what was going on with that cable. And I would, you know, I would start the openings, trying to get the cable to end like at the top of the shoulder sleeve where there was like near a crossing. And right. so I was planning all those different parts of the garment out. Yes. I did a lot of planning in that, that little composition book. 
Exactly. So it's helped me quite a bit is to have that handy and nearby. One of the things I did for my sweater, it was a, a Fair Isle sweater, and mm -hmm. um, mine had fairly large motifs on it. And I was like really worried about where they were going to fall, you know, so I knitted pr a pretty good sized swatch and then I photocopied it to make like a full piece of fabric. Yes. And and so then I could put it on me that that big piece of paper. I could align it before I started knitting. I did that before I started knitting, so I could see where the motifs. I wanted them because I did a yoke all over a motif, but with a yoke, and mm -hmm. um, so my decreases and stuff kept the motif in pattern. You know, but yes. so it, it was it was interesting. But same thing. I pre-planned it. I pre-planned yeah, it. Very important. So I had some of the motifs I'd done in like other sweaters that'd be like 36 stitches across. And so those larger motifs, you really had to plan like how they were placed and where they would hit, you know, when you have a cardigan opening. Right. And stuff too. Or how to start, like when you um, join the sleeves to the body of the sweater, if you're doing, you know, bottom up, which I, I prefer for many reasons. But you, sometimes you had to think about too, if the design would get pulled under the arm. And right. Stuff. So you have to maybe add some rows. Exactly. But again, the planning helps quite a bit. It's really critical. So when you turned in your, uh, how long did it take you to do level one? Level one um, took three weeks to do. And so I turned that in and I found out that um, I had to redo two of the swatches and answer, I think it was three questions. I, I write down all these notes on my Ravelry page. So if anyone, all these things I'm saying, like what I did to set myself up, I've got them all listed on my Ravelry page if anyone's curious to look at. So that's I've a good resource for everybody, yes. About what I would do. I also try to include some of the videos I thought were helpful. Um, I include that on there and there's other project pages I use for um, putting my favorite references and videos. But all that is listed, you know, and how to, how to do that. So Judith uh, made a, a comment here. She said, I use paper and pencil and notebooks for plans, designs and comments on yarn. I struggle with tracking online with knit companion, etc. Color work for me needs to have a printout. You know, I use, uh, I use graph paper, but I also use knitters graph paper. Yes, I did that with my software. I did stitch fiddle. And I just did their basic. I was able to get by with the basic, even though my husband kept offering. To, he said it'd be so easy if you just go ahead and upgrade. But the stitch fiddle did allow you to, you could tack in exactly what your stitch and row count was. And that changed. Like when I charted out my initial for the, um, the duplicate stitch design, when I first put it in and then I used the stitch fiddle, it was in the wrong proportion than what I wanted in my mind. Yes. So the stitch fiddle helps quite a bit because it will take account, or like the dinner's graph paper, right. about the difference between your row and your stitch gauges. So, so that is help. Susan Day wants to know what your Ravelry name is. It is Hey Carrie Ann, but does it show up on the, my own? Um, I think it showed up. I thought maybe you used it on the biography. Yeah, I did. It's in the in below this video in the description is her Ravelry. It's Hey Carrie Ann, all one word. And it's it's a nod to the Hollies. Yes. Music. Hey so Carrie Ann, <laughs> what's your game? <laughs> I and love it. Winners. And whenever they make me a music tape, yeah, they include, you know, one one of the songs would always be the Hey Carrie Ann. It's kind of Right, right. So on on those swatches for uh, level one, they probably weren't what you thought you would have to repeat. Was it a you know? Did they find something you weren't looking at? Oh wow! I cannot. I can't remember which ones I had to redo. Um, but no, that is true because a lot of times that you worry about or that you're so concerned about that it um, it it was a level that passed. And there's other things that, um, gosh, I wish I remembered which ones. Do you want me to pull that out? But anyhow, I think what I did, I only had like both of the times, I remember my second level, it was only like one buttonhole that I had to redo. 
and stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of things that surprised me that they, you know, they passed. The second one I had to do, I knew how to do the, the seaming, you know, in stock and net. The new ones were doing the seaming and, um, or edge to edge in the different stitch. Uh -huh. Those were, I was concerned because I hadn't had as much practice in them and they passed, which I was really pleased with. But I think that's another thing that I think was a secret. I told you about how I organized and prepared myself and all that copious amounts of reading because that was available when I was out in the car and I knew the lighting wouldn't, wouldn't be all that good out in the car, but it was perfect for doing the paperwork. Right. But saved, I had a, like a few hours in the middle of the morning that I set aside and that was the time I would do the swatch knitting. The natural light was the best I didn't have any um, any sounds, any distractions, and I focused so intently on doing the swatch. And I think I remember, I think there were some articles I followed Arena Holiday's blog too. And so many of the times she said, if you are just aware of your tension, you can, a lot of times you'll just resolve it, you know, at that time. Exactly. So that's what I did. I trusted that. And I, you know, I did the swatches only when I, wouldn't have any distractions all by myself and I was focusing intently on how I was making the stitches right and then I could catch myself I have a very critical eye so if I saw something I would redo it at the time right. but as it turned out I only before I even mailed in the binder I only had maybe like a couple swatches that I would redo and I would reassess them after I took a break and had a clean perspective to look at it and see if I see how I felt about the swatches. I think that was important too, is to take a, know when you need to take a break. Right, exactly. Sometimes you focus too hard and nothing works. But I, what you're talking about, I call that mindful knitting. And mindful knitting is not easy. You know, paying attention stitch after stitch in something that you usually zone out while you're doing it. It's very hard training your brain to do that, but that's really the only way that you can see if you need to make corrective changes in how you're holding the yarn, the needles, or creating the stitches. You have to watch them being created. Mm -hmm. I think yep. that was probably a very, I mean, it sounds very simple, but that was probably the biggest factor that, I mean, it kept the momentum of the program going. So I was, you know, I was constantly, you know, learning the new technique with a new swatch. But I didn't feel defeated, you know, looking at it or being unhappy with the swatches because I was so focused and producing a pretty good swatch, you know, from from the first first time. So I do think that did help. So knowing that you were going to go through all three levels, which I'm sure you thought you would do right from step one, mm -hmm. when did you start thinking about your sweater and your hat? Okay, the. Um, Let's see here. The, the hats. Oh yeah, the hat was level three. Well, when I was waiting to get my second level back, it the post office lost it in I think it was Pennsylvania. And I was worried about that, but I, I had more time. I was trying to get my mind off of it. And I that's where I started. I started with the hat, you know, and I was going to do Fair Isle. So that I was able to look through all these different pattern books and it was inspiring. It, kept my mind busy. And so I started that probably that month I was waiting. And then I, so I, I was doing that during May. And then I, I did the hat worked up very fast after, well, here's the hat. But, um, oh, very nice. Joy of Color book. And they talked about um, doing like, so I had three colors chosen, three types of blues and three of the yellows. And I really liked that the first part of the hat I figured out was this very middle section. And it was mostly just the checkered pattern. And it was the darkest navy, almost a black with the white. And I love that sharp contrast. So that was the first band that I was positive of. And then from there, I did that reverse. So you went from the lightest, you know, yellow colors um, paired with the darkest blue, and then you faded, you know, just the inverse. Right, that. right. So, but yeah. That's Isn't that fun though, playing with the color like that? Oh, can, can you see? Yes. Oh, the, the top of the hat? Yeah, let's see the top, the star. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's just stunningly beautiful. Thank 
you. So cool. Yeah, I've got a picture. I don't know if it works. My son, does that show? The oh yeah. yeah, cute. Blocked. Cute son. So I blocked it on the um, using a a small soup pot. It was a brand new soup pot, but it ended up being the perfect size in to get the the shape that I wanted. So, so. Rick, Rick is on here. Rick said, just so you all know, Carrie is the best sister-in-law ever wearing the sweater she knitted for me today. Oh, and oh, I've got that sweater too, if you want to see that. And Scott says, Uncle Rick, I know she'll be tickled to know that. <laughs> I love it. So Scott, Scott is the one that was wearing the hat. This is the sweater. I did this sweater um, after I joined level one in master hand knitting. I knitted three of these sweaters. So my two oldest sons got one of these sweaters and then Rick, my brother-in-law saw it and he said he wanted a sweater too, but he's over six feet tall. So it took quite some time, but it's yeah. an alpaca blend. So it's a very drapey. It's got a nice sheen to it. And it- What's the um, yarn? It's alpaca blend. Oh, uh-huh. And it has, I've got the attached zipper Oh, cool. And I used, it was Tech Knitters um, technique approach where you use that knit fixer. Knit yes. Fixer. It looks like a miniature latch hook. Uh huh. And so you use that to draw yarn to the tape of your zipper. And then you attach the um, zipper to the sweater itself. And then I used the eye cord to cover the zipper. And then I, um, then I changed the pattern where I knit the collar twice as long so I could do a pull the collar to give it more substance. Uh huh. So gorgeous. So, so did you ever so think that you should be an there. engineer instead of an optometrist? I love engineering a lot. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I just I at the time I was a student, I also loved, you know, I loved optics. I love physics. I love the biology. class. I loved all of it. Yeah. So it was so much fun. But then what well, my husband though did do engineering. So he's an aerospace engineer. Wow. And he he reviews a lot of these patents. And so, so it's always interesting to hear the different ideas. But with the aerospace, you're studying not only like aircraft and watercraft, um, but that's where I think the interest is with the sailing. And so I've seen a lot of the knitters, they mentioned that their husbands are these sailboat you know right. racing sailboat. so they love sailboats yes and i wonder too if they tend to be an engineer minded right person. and a lot of a lot of knitters i found a lot of the people that i know that went through the master hand knitting program have a medical background and that's mm -hmm. not necessarily medical but i think it's more science related that their brain just functions that way and and there are people uh that didn't go through science programs but they still have a science oriented brain you yes. know and in, in, in the classes that I teach, when, um, when we start talking about gauge and stuff and the word math comes up, you can just see people's eyes glaze over, you know, but I tell them really math, uh, knitting is in, in, intuitive to your brain in the math part of your brain, even though you may not think you like math, if you like knitting, your brain is math oriented you just you nobody ever taught it to you in a way that you got it you know it has to do with our education system not that your brain doesn't do math it has mm -hmm. to do with how we present math in the education system that it's very linear and if you don't get it you're not there's no other way for you to go you know but most knitters their brains are very math oriented whether they realize it or not so yes. Uh, Ruth wants to know, Ruth Steuben wants to know, have you published your hat pattern? No, I haven't yet. Um, I do plan on doing that. I already told Cast On that I would um, submit a pattern and they said that they wouldn't be able to even, they're like booked up and they wouldn't probably even print it, I think until maybe fall or winter. And so I have plenty of time to get it in, but I will be submitting a pattern. I do want, plan on doing that. So, that's very cool and a lot of people ask about that when it when i yes. completed it and i posted pictures of it and, and so, so susan day long. wants to know how long did it take you to complete level two level two was oh i took a long break um between level one and level two um i took like a well it was about a month and a half break but i did a lot of christmas knitting at that time and so then when I started level two, it took me about two and a half months 
when I submitted it. But the binder was ready to submit, you know, right before there were um, TKGA meetings and stuff. So there was there was a long wait to get the feedback. And then that was, yeah. But it, it took me two and a half months for level two. So it probably took as long for it to be reviewed as it did for you to do it. Yes. Yes, that's about right. That's about the right time. So what did you have? You said, uh, what did you have to redo on level two? Level two was very easy. There was um, the, the um, fair isle, the wrist uh, cuff. One of the colors was, um, made, it was not dark enough. I was trying to use, I love um, Finu yarn, and I don't have any yarn stash to worry about except for the fair isle yarns. And so I try to stick with just one brand so I can right. Uh, Right. About it is my yarn to go to. But I was using yarn from Stash, and one of one of the yarns was sky blue, I believe, and it wasn't enough contrast with the white, and so that was very sad, just because of yarn choice. Right. I, I designed that. I designed the Feral Cuff mm -hmm. in level two. That was my design. I That's did. Cool. Yes, I thought I recognized it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. um, too bad I didn't add a stick to it. But I do that now. So that then, then, the, yeah. The how master. long? How long did you wait between level two and level three? Oh, level three, I signed up immediately. As soon as I got <laughs> the official notice, I passed. I stayed on the computer. I printed off my instructions, and that's where I set up my document files. And so I did as much as I could as I was sitting right there at the computer. Right. So some of the SIS pages, I would uh, cut and paste like the headings, like where you have to list, you know, the yard. Right. Like, or like put the patterns. So I did a lot of that. You know, another tip that people say, but I think a lot of people are aware of that is like the, the bibliography. You know, once you have your master bibliography from one of the levels, you can paste that over and then right. you can modify, you know, right. which, which references you use or which new ones you need to add. So a lot of that I could do at that very same time. Right. I did the same thing. In fact, I got a tip from Charles Gandy on the, mm -hmm. I used easy bib, which is an online thing that keeps track of your bib. And so when I, uh, all the things I used for level one, I turned them all to red. Yes. And as I used them for level two, I turned them to black. Uh huh. So they then, and right then away. added new ones, you know, and then same thing for level three, I changed them all to red and then moved them to black as I, that so I didn't have to duplicate them. You know, I just had to change the page numbers or whatever, you know. Um, That's a great help. Yes, that was very good. Yeah, also, too. Oh, the, go ahead. setting up your swatch information sheets in advance because you can just cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste, or duplicate. Yes. Because they're helps. all very similar. And then, you know, just fill in the information. That's where I, on my level three, I had one resubmit. My resubmit was that I duplicated the wrong swatch information sheet. So I didn't really have to resubmit. Carolyn, Carolyn Vance was my level three reviewer and she emailed me and she said, I think you accidentally copied the wrong page. I and I did, I had, my, I had it all made up. So I just emailed yeah. it to her. And yes. that was, that's, that's when I passed. I did one of the two where yeah. I had a page that went with one swatch, but I had it as part of the other swatch. Yeah, so you just have to be proofread. Yes. Yeah, but by the time you get done, you're sick of it and you want to send it off, you know, it's like, well, yeah, it's exciting because then, I mean, then, you know, you're going to be getting that feedback and that's where you really grow and you learn, you know, from a different perspective than your own. Yeah, especially in level one, you don't know what to expect on the feedback. And then when you do get it, then you kind of have an idea of what to expect for level two and level three. And you actually look forward to it instead yes. of dreading it. Yes. Yeah, because you know you're going to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was, I was always more excited about getting the feedback. I never, I, I hear a lot of people say that they're worried or that they feel really upset. You know, maybe they focus on the criticism, but for some reason overall, I was very excited about the, the words. Um, I mean, they're, they're con so constructed. They're so professional about it. Yes. And are so helpful in getting a better product. Writing out. the letters is an art in itself. Yes. Yeah. I wrote a lot of letters. Yeah. I still have a lot of them. I save them. But um, something, too, for people that I used to tell people, and I'm sure other people have said this, too, that when you get your letter back, if you mm -hmm. feel overwhelmed with the negative, take like a 
two colored okay. highlighting pins and highlight all the positive in one color and then and highlight just the highlights if you need to uh, to boost yourself up yes exactly because yeah. usually the negative is very little but when you read it it looks really big you know <laughs> and but usually some small and you, they usually sandwich it between other positive things you know um so it's it's very so let's see your sweater yes and let's hear the story about it what 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 was the start of your idea look at that isn't that beautiful oh i love the neck let's see the neck how you folded it over that's gorgeous oh yes about the neck too is when i did that i don't know if you can see do you see where it looks like a double braid yes there so i i did that too when i bound off i made it so it looked like a double braid to match the other one so when they're seamed together you see a double braid effect that's very awesome that was also kind of planning ahead right oh and here's a picture of my son wearing it that you can see how it fits in which i thought the fit turned out really that's really that's that. gorgeous that's so. really beautiful so let's look at the sweater some more yes i'm going to get that um let's see here let's see if i can hold it's it's a heavy sweater but i don't know if you can see so you can see a little bit of the ribbing yes initially i wanted to do a sweater that had the twisted single rib i thought that was so pretty uh -huh. but as i was um testing out the swatches i decided i wanted to know what element i wanted to bring into the ribbing and i thought the cable seemed too big yes and also i didn't want the baubles to be in the ribbing either and so i chose the little three stitch that you can see going down yes. the ribbon i like that and then the rest of the ribbing does flow into the cables quite nicely yes yeah i did try to do that i, I spaced out also all the um stitches i needed to add it i made it so all the cables seemed like they fit and flowed in yes in places to me that's yeah. like I always, it's too, so important because so many sweaters you see, it looks like the ribbing was just cut and pasted on. There's no relationship between the ribbing and the body of the garment. You know, I think the ribbing, I loved your ribbing. It came out beautiful. That's Thank gorgeous. You. Thank you. Very nice. Oh, the other one, it was, um, it was the raglan style is what I did here instead of the dropped shoulder. And so I even ordered like books on how to design Aaron's sweaters. And it was funny when they did get to the um, the Raglan style. I mean, they they discuss how to do like satin sleeves, how to do drop, but they say it'll just take a lot of math. They didn't really go into how to try to figure it out and plan it. So there was a lot more yes. design than I had to figure. I mean, and I thought I thought Raglan, I liked the way it fits. Yes. And I thought the Raglan would be very easy, but as it turned out, it was done um, bottom up. So it involved more than I thought. Plus the raglan, I didn't want to do a straight raglan. That would have been more easy, but I did where you change the rate. Right, um, right, like exactly. Paper, what it's called, but it's like a, almost a baseball tee or something where it starts in and then it curves faster, you know, toward the back. Yes, so um, you have a special comment over here from Joyce Jones. Yes. She said, hey, just caught this. I was her co-chair and enjoyed so much seeing her work. I love she Joyce. Joyce is awesome. She's such a kind lady. Well, do you realize she was, um, she was communicating with me right on that weekend of Christmas and traveling, that she was communicating and answering back and forth so she could give me the news by Christmas Eve day. Oh, that's so sweet. No, She's it was super nice. So nice. That's what Carolyn did. I got my um, a level three uh, very near my birthday and um, and uh, somebody had asked me what my favorite birthday cake was and I said German chocolate she sent a picture of a slice of German chocolate cake in with my review that's my dad's favorite birthday cake too yeah. my mom would always make a special homemade German chocolate cake for him. yeah okay so Kayan wants to know mm -hmm. is there any reason you chose to knit the sweater for your son rather than for yourself like knitting for a woman has more considerations of bust and shape oh no i just i was my son's been super enthusiastic about the items i can show my um also like my level two best if people are you know are oh yeah about we'll want to see that too but um but yeah my, my son he i mean he loves the vintage clothing so he he had very specific ideas what he wanted for the best that was part 
of an attire to wear vintage pieces. And then he wanted to wear that, um, oh, it was our trip to uh, Mackinac Island. But that was also, I found out, that was the site of where one of the TK yes. Jamie used to be. Yes. He played in the geranium room. If you remember how that room looked, it was gorgeous. But he played piano there. Wow. You know, Wow. Yeah, but we had we had a little we had a little mini meeting there. That was so fun. Oh my gosh. That was wonderful. That's when the bugs came out when we came back to the, on the ferry <laughs> back and all the little black gnats were out. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Charles had a brand new car, then he had a little his little Volkswagen bug and it was just it was almost black. There were so many gnats on it. And when oh. you breathe, they go in your nose. It's like <laughs> ah! yes. Um so let's see your level two vest. Sure. So here is the level two vest. Very and pretty. I'm son wearing it. It's on the project page. Let's see it up closer. Level. Let's see the neckline. Oh, the, the neckline, I'm very proud. But again, that's just stuff that the, you see where the center decrease line. Yep, there's, looks good. Then, oh, what I had to do for that too, the, the design is it's rope cables. And then I have sections of just stocking that rib. But for that center rib, I had to add an extra column because it was an even stitch. So I wanted odd column to, so that center chain stitch could tie into the, um, the V neck. Right. Rib. Exactly. Is when I picked up the stitches up along here, I had to add an extra column hidden um, at the time that I was getting ready to shape the V neck. Yeah. So I had something like that. The other thing I had to do here is um, I had to make the front and the back a little asymmetric. So I had to add an extra cable because I wanted the seam to be between a knit stitch and the purl stitch. I thought I could hide the seam better that way. But I actually then had to give the cable to like the back side. Right. And so you had to adjust that and it made the um, instructions more difficult. You couldn't take the shorthand approach and say it's you're going to follow the, you know, the front the same as the back. So it made it a little, little more complicated writing the instructions. But I was, I was very pleased with how it turned out. So did you design that? I oh yes, I I designed it. Yes. And then when I was so close, I was like halfway done, and then there was notices sent out to everybody that they were about ready to do away with allowing you to design your own sweater. And so I was a little worried about getting it submitted right away and getting it turned in where it would still be acceptable. And so, so yeah, I, I designed it. And this is where I also did about the cables where they would, you know, where they would finish close to where the seam was. And I did a slope. slope right, right. So, exactly. All of those things are exactly how I like to figure things out too. It's just, I love those portions of it. That's what makes it fun. So Brenda Can says, question, do you have to be an expert knitter to complete the certificate? You just have to really have an interest and passion in learning. Yeah, you're learning. You're, it's a yeah. self. It's a self-guided. It's mostly a self-guided journey. They give you parameters that you have to fulfill. They don't teach you. It's not a teaching course. It's a journey, and they give you the roadmap, and you follow the roadmap on the journey. And everybody's journey is a little bit different. And yes. and you can take. There's different time frames. You know, like Carrie Ann did it rapidly. But she just dove in head first into the big pool, into the big ocean, and just started swimming. And but other people can take years. I know people who've taken years to do every single level. And but everybody, when they finish, they're a far better knitter than they were when they started. And it's not just about the knitting and making the stitches. It's about learning about knitting and the history of knitting and the fiber and um, why you would use this fiber over that fiber and the characteristics and it's all and writing patterns or understanding even how to write a pattern and and charting and it's all of the elements a big ball of wax all about knitting and and i loved every minute of it and i think carrie obviously loved every minute of it and then now let me ask you a question when i finished it i had a big letdown did you Yes, I, I still I, I miss that. I miss that drive. Um, but again, I'm still trying to look and choose patterns where the yarn, you know, I, well, my, my husband motioned, but he, 
Oh, since I've been knitting, um, I asked if he would like a sweater when I did the sweaters for everybody in my family. He said, no, he's okay. Um, but then he found a Norwegian sweater and it has cables in the body. It has color sleeves, the shawl collar, and it's knit with a um, striped yarn, um, Norwegian yarn. It's very sticky, one of their older yarns that they produced. And he ordered me the yarn, you know, around Christmas time. So I've been very excited and stuff about that. So that's, isn't that's that cool? Kind of I think I get more excited again about choosing a project that has a lot of history. If I can read about that history again, or about the yarn being extra special. Exactly, exactly. It's all the memories. It's just like, this has nothing to do with the Master Hand Knitting Program, but when I travel, I, I always knit when I'm traveling. And I usually try to get some yarn from somewhere that I'm traveling. And then whenever I have that project, I'm wearing it or using it, it brings all the memories back associated with creating it on the journey, the traveling, you know? Um, yeah. So this is Vanita Tyel. She says, how many hours per day or week did you spend during your master hand knitting work? Oh, like I, I said, it was probably about, if you take away the driving time, I probably had about six hours a day of reading and doing any of the answering the questions, writing the patterns, writing the instructions. So I spent about six hours a day doing that and I couldn't change. That was just a given because I was there. Um, there in the car with my notebook and the resources. And then I probably would spend about two or three hours at home in addition to that. So gosh, probably it doesn't have to be, you know, the six plus three hours, but that's what I apply toward it. Right. So. Now, um, Nicole uh, Josen says, what can you do with this master knitter degree title? And since it's kind of a distance education, is it available only in the US or globally? It is globally available, but you have to, you know, the shipping is the only thing you have to work out, but there are, there's lots of people internationally going to the program. Um, so what you can do with it? And that's something that I meant to ask Carrie at the beginning, and I kind of overlooked it. When you first started, when you th were thinking about getting into the Master Hand Knitting Program, why did you want to do it? What was the purpose? Like what you had just said about, um, I loved all aspects. You know, I found out that I really loved learning about the history. I started learning about the different sheep breeds out there, and I even enjoy reading books about that. Um, I enjoy challenging myself with the techniques. I like the idea that I could do the very best on my own because I do, I do my best work, you know, being kind of figuring it out and problem solving on my own. And then the idea that then you could have it looked out and assessed, you know, by other master knitters, getting their feedback. Right. So I really, I look forward to that. I was excited to learn, maybe get a different perspective maybe have things pointed out to me that I wouldn't have realized on my own because I'm pretty disciplined already. And to follow up on that, did it change how you feel about yourself as a knitter? Probably it does. You know, I, I would like to say that, you know, I was so disciplined that, you know, I would keep that going. Um, but it, it was fantastic to get feedback and it challenged me to learn some stitches that I, I heard about but I didn't think I needed to learn, you know, or that they didn't really apply to the projects I was interested in. And then especially that's level three. But um, I found out that there's so many more techniques and areas of knitting that I enjoy doing and want to do more of. Yeah, level three is like a potpourri. You know, it you get to try hard. a little bit of everything and things you may not have tried before and you like yes. brioche knitting, I loved it. I had never tried that before, and that swatch is hideous to knit. If you make a mistake, oh my gosh. Uh, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, but other people use the Master Hand Knitting Program for a wide variety of things. Some people want to uh, publish patterns or write uh, technical articles for magazines. Um, I did it for myself. I just wanted to learn more about something that I loved so much. And in the end, it turned into what I do now, which is my YouTube channel and the classes that I teach and stuff. I had no intentions of doing any of that. It wasn't even in my radar anywhere. 
but it just evolved into that. And what I did after I finished the master handing, because there is a big letdown, because I, I was the same way. I didn't do it nearly as fast, but I spent many, many hours every single day, and I worked full time during that time. I spent all my spare time working on the master hand knitting program and I didn't do any outside knitting uh, until I was through it. But then there's that letdown. But what I did is I started researching more knitting stuff, you know, like I, double knitting. So I really dove into double knitting and then I dove into brioche, you know, and I took each one of those things and did a ton of research on it and um, and kept and I still do that. When I do my videos, my educational videos and stuff, I research everything. Mm -hmm. I research everything. Um, yes. And I may come up with my own opinion, but it's based upon the research that I do. I'm not making okay. it up out of thin air. So, Ann Tremolier says, Suzanne, you taught in brioche, me brioche knitting with your first eye tag knit along, and I fell in love with it and with your teachings. Thank you, Ann. So, um, is it think about you if you have any questions because we're going to wrap this up in a few minutes so if you people have any questions post them up there it takes a couple minutes for them to come where i can see them so what's on your plate next carrie what do you have planned next um mostly just enjoying i've got some projects that i want to do next i do plan on um, submitting the pattern for the hat and i like the idea of um, writing patterns I don't know about grading the patterns yet. So that's something that I might need to look into doing classes. Right. I like to be able to, I like to get more involved in helping people, you know, problem solve. And I think that's the most fun is when you can work with somebody and you go back and forth and you're figuring out, you know, right. sharing, sharing, possible. you like to share. Yes. Yes. So that makes, that makes it more fun. So more I fun. had a, a uh, my recent interviewee uh, week before last was uh, Claire Mountain mm -hmm. from Sister Mountain. She has a website. Have you seen her website? Yes. She has classes. I don't realize her website, but I knew her from some of her videos. You need to her, go to her, her website. She, she has classes. She teaches grading. Yes. She's the only one that I, I know of. Interview with her. It was a yes. Yes. interview. Yeah. So okay. let's see if we've got any over here. Most of the people are saying, uh, thank you and um somebody missy says she tried brioche for the first time today she said i think it looks pretty bad but only four rows in well brioche is one of those things the first inch or so looks horrible even if you're an expert at it it doesn't start uh, showing itself until you get more into it and then all of a sudden it starts looking beautiful Ellen Nordle said, must one invest in an entire reference library for completion of the master knitting program at home? No, I think you could get through it with a, a, a minimum of maybe four or five books. A lot of times you can check books out of the library, your local library system, many of the books you can check out of your library, but also on Amazon, you can buy used books. And a lot of the books that I ended up getting uh, were used. You can get them for very inexpensive because these are not books that you're going to be, you know, they're books you're going to have open and be spreading out. You're going to be using these books, so you don't need to have them in pristine condition. Yes. Yeah, my favorite um, references, I thought the basic techniques was the um, the principles of knitting, um, Hyatt, and then the handbook of knitting and uh catherine buses the big book of knitting yes i love that's one of my favorite books <laughs> well that's one yeah there's more and more the more you look at it the you know it's deceiving but there's more stuff to learn from it and of course the vogue knitting i probably didn't use as much because it didn't have as much in depth on the text part but it has great you know photographs and stuff and that so. i i liked uh vogue knitting um nancy wiseman's uh finishing book the Knitter's mm -hmm. Handbook by Monsi Stanley. I'm looking at my books over here. Um, Catherine, Katharina Buss's Big Book of Knitting. Um, and then I also like, uh, for the Stitch Dictionaries, I like Barbara Walker's. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and I also like the vintage, um, um, the Stitch Dictionaries that are the, uh, um, I can't think of the name right now. The Harmony Guides. 
You can get those used. Yes. They are awesome. I also ordered some of those. I like so them because they're, available. They're, I can, they're pretty easy to find. And there's a lot of information on every page, so they don't take up a lot of shelf space, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. Okay, so uh, Timothy Collinson said, is there a place to see the full requirements for the current levels to see what I'd be getting into? Also, thank you so much for the discussion. And um, yes, you can go to the TKGA website, tkga.org. Also, on Ravelry, if you're a Ravelry person, there's a TKGA forum and you can get tons of information from that forum, um, even if you're just interested. Um, to tell you the truth, the, T the Master Hand Knitting Program was the best gift I ever gave myself in my entire life. I would have to say that. So it was worth every minute that I spent on it. Um, the money is negligible compared to what you learn. It's very affordable. Okay, uh, Vanita said, what were your go-to yarns for the swatches for submission? Oh, the um, go-to yarns was the worsted way I did the patents, classic worsted. And um, then I did the finugard for any of the fingering weight yarns. Um, and I used spinning yarn for the lace. One of the, the yarns they recommended on the TKGA um, site was really hard to find. It was like a baby lace yarn, but it was hard for me to locate. Yeah, I used um, a Cascade worsted non-superwash. And one of the most beautiful sweaters I saw the whole time I was reviewing was um, in a fisherman's wool. Uh -huh. And that's probably the least expensive yarn you know, you get a huge skein like this for, you know, and a lot of people kind of look down on it because it's inexpensive, but I'll tell you, it made a beautiful well, sweater. Someone, though, did say, there was someone that commented that um, they used to like the fisherman wool, but they said it either was discontinued or it changed. Oh, so you may want yeah. to check into that if it's yeah. a more recent one. Exactly, but one. Patton's Classic Worsted is another excellent, excellent yarn inexpensive so you don't feel like you're using your best yarn you know to make these little swatches okay so we're going to call it a, a day thank you so much carrie for being on here Thanks for having me this was really was fun. fun i really really enjoyed this interview i appreciate it and so Thanks. we'll see you all next time okay Bye -bye. happy knitting Thanks.